Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar organized jointly by the Middle East and North Africa program of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and the Global Politics and Security program. My name is Ruzbe Parsi, I head the MENA program and in the control room behind the scene as it were is Sophie Berlund and colleagues from the GPS program. This is the second installment of a series about the role of religion in foreign politics and in international politics and how they interact with how religion is perceived and practiced domestically in societies. So in the previous installment, we were discussing what we mean with the secular order, which defines and underpins the whole notion of international politics in our modern day. And in this seminar, we are going to primarily look at how this is constituted in various countries. And the two countries we have chosen are India and Russia. So we will be looking at how religion plays a role in those societies and to what extent that in turn affects their foreign policy. But we will also look at how religion interacts with the whole global human rights discourse and to what extent we have universal values and people can feel that they're part of that and whether they can be codified beyond something very general like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for instance. Now, in order to do this, I have three very distinguished experts with me. Uh, I will start with Dr. Erin uh, Wilson, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Politics and Religion and Vice Dean and Director of Education in the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, Erin has worked a lot on the intersection of religion and secularism and specific global issues such as gender equality and human rights. She's the author of several books and articles. I'll just pinpoint two of them here, which are of particular interest. The Refugee Crisis in Religion from 2016 and After Secularism, Rethinking Religion in Global Politics. She's also the co-chair of the advisory network for Transatlantic Policy Network on Religion and Diplomacy, uh, which is one of those institutions or rather organizations, if you will, that help try and create a better understanding of what do we conceive as religion and to what extent can that conception uh, be universal or at least be translatable. Then comes Alicia Suranovic, who is associate professor at the Faculty of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Warsaw. She holds a PhD in political science, which is specifically on the religious factor in the foreign policy of the Russian Federation. And so Russian foreign policy and religious factors in international relations are part of her focus. Her latest monograph is The Sense of Mission in Russian Foreign Policy, Destined for Greatness, exclamation mark. And I think we will need to get back to that exclamation mark at some point in the conversation. Last but not least is Henrik Schetan Aspengren, a colleague of mine here at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. He's the acting head of the Asia program and coordinator of the South Asia Initiative. Um, he holds a PhD from SOAS and is author of several books, journal articles, especially on politics in South Asia and India. And I'm very happy to have the three of you here with us. This conversation is streamed live, uh, live streamed on Facebook as well as our website, and it will be also recorded for those who cannot attend. Those who are attending now can ask questions. You can ask them in the chat of this Zoom conversation, but you can also do it via Facebook. We will try and bring those questions into the conversation as we go along. So um, let us kind of do a bit of a recap from the previous seminar, at least in terms of the, the theoretical underpinnings of the conversation, but do that by asking you, Erin, to help us understand a bit how we can conceptualize what is religion in relation to politics or rather the secular. Uh, I know there is one particular term that you and others have used, which is the ontological injustice of the secular order um, and secularism. So why don't we start there? How is it that, in a sense, we assume the secular to be not only normal as in most frequent, but also perhaps normatively the only way of conceptualizing private, public politics uh, versus what is not politics? Please. 
Thanks, Rajbe, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's a little bit daunting to um, be talking with you and with the other colleagues who are here today. So um, yeah, it's a great honor. Um, the term ontological injustice, um, I borrowed from uh, cultural anthropology scholars um, and they are, one of the, the things that they're concerned with in that field is the idea that we don't all inhabit the same world, if you like. So the way that we perceive the world from within a secular order is very different from the way someone who lives outside of a secular order might perceive it. And this secular order, I think um, in the previous webinar, um, Professor Heard gave a very, very clear kind of overview of how this secular order developed historically. It's very much embedded in the, it, it's, it's entangled with the development of the modern nation state. And it's very much about the power and authority of the state over religion, or this thing that we label religion. And so it, what ontological injustice is concerned with is this idea that the kind of central assumption of a secular order that there is something that we can clearly identify and label as religion. And that is distinct from other things like economics, education, politics. And so then this is, this is a relatively new kind of development in the, the historical order, if you like. Um, and, it's, and then what, how do we define and identify what that thing that we call religion is? There's a certain set of assumptions behind that term tied with this historical development, which is very specific to, um, I think I, some people might say the Euro-American experience, but I think we could even say the European experience because the, the modern state emerged in the European context and was then exported via uh, colonialism. Um, and so this idea, the assumptions about religion that sit behind this are very particular to the European experience, I think. And that, that experience kind of the, attributes uh, religion as being a source of violence. Um, it's a source of division and a source of disagreement amongst people. And so um, there, and there are other assumptions that kind of emerge more recently about the possibilities for religion being used for, for peace and for reconciliation. Um, but I think in, in both of these kind of, in, in either construction, whichever way you look at it, there's still this idea that we've got this clearly identifiable thing that is religion. And then the question becomes, well, how do we define that? And that is where we come unstuck because everyone has different ideas, especially at the grassroots level. Everyone has different ideas about what religion is, whose, whose beliefs and practices are classified as religion or are not, and where we draw that line and make that decision. And that's where I think we end up coming, uh, getting into trouble, particularly when it comes to the human, human rights issues and human rights abuses. Very good, thank you. I mean, that really gives us uh, several doors that we need to go through in order to, to get anywhere when it comes to understanding this phenomenon. Um, so in a sense, it's about a very particular historical experience in Europe where at some point religion was defined as a volatile variable that kind of could undo society and therefore had to be um, compartmentalized, as it were, from what was emerging as the public, the public yes. sphere. Yes, and now, I think also, sorry, to just to emphasize that, that is about the, the competition for power between state authority and uh, religious authority at the time. And so this also this secular order also becomes a way for the state to assert its authority over religious institutions and religious authorities. And that in a sense is then the next kind of fork in the road, which is what kind of authority do you want to exercise over religion or do you simply just want it to not be part of the purview of the public sphere and what the state can regulate? So the exactly. conversation about freedom from religion, freedom of religion. Now, as you mentioned yourself, this partly assumes a kind of a hierarchical, structurally organized church-like, uh, not, you know, it's not a coincidental, a church-like uh, way of, of constituting religion as a practice. Henrik, let me bring you in here in the conversation because obviously when we're talking about India, where, or basically we could talk about a lot of places outside of Europe, the idea of religion in a kind of a singular sense with a very clear hi hierarchy that is institutionalized in a very clear way is not necessarily the historical experience. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ruspe. And thank you so much, Erin, as well, for that uh, great uh, introduction to this uh, conversation. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, in, a, in a country like India, that kind of homogeneous experience of religion has never been there. It's a pluralistic society with, um, with several religions coexisting. Um, so the, the kind of sharp division between, uh, uh, if, we, if you say the state or the political organization and, and religion could, could not really be um, uh, implemented. So what I think, think we have seen in India, uh, and this goes back to, to before independence and even you know, during the sort of independence movement and onwards through decolonization and today, is rather a competition between two types, types of nationalism um, uh, and where you have um, um, a sort of secular nationalism that, uh, that uh, doesn't really build on a separation between, uh, if you call it a religion or church or, or state, but is more of a sort of non-differentiating uh, uh, secularism where, where several um, religions coexist and you have a principal distance to these religion and you have a religious nationalism um, and that kind of competition between the, those two nationalisms uh, has been uh, in the Indian experience uh, uh, since, since uh, the early um, 20th century or late 19th, uh, 19th century I should say and where you have seen the pendulum swing uh, towards religious nationalism as it is today, pronouncing one uh, re religion or one community uh, ahead of others. That's very interesting because it also points, as you said yourself, to the fact that perhaps the kind of collective conscience or if you will, the mainstream history writing has tended to uh, obfuscate or Photoshop out a bit this other uh, strand of how a national uh, collective consciousness has been built. And India is just one example. We could look at Algeria, we could look at other cases where the kind of the religious strand has been left out. And then when it returns, people tend to interpret this as a resurgence of religion, which then of course assumes that it wasn't there all along. Um, but it would seem to me that in the Indian case as well, uh, that was not the case. It was there all along. It just was not at the pinnacles of power or, or not even necessarily organized as a political entity as much as a kind of a grassroots organization, for instance. Would that be a fair description? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Um, I mean, there is also a sense that the sort of secular idioms that were brought in during independence, uh, that those idioms were, were also some sort of elite idioms and very West-oriented idioms. So that the 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 some branches of the Indian independence movement picked up idioms and ideas that came from the West and tried to implement them uh, and secularism being one of those into the Indian uh, context and Indian experience. So what you have then is, is, is also a sense that religion has been pushed aside, but not only by sort of foreign elements, but also by uh, domestic elites. And so you get this idea that bringing not really bringing religion back in, but 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 uh, giving religion a voice is also such a, a kind of anti-establishment uh, 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 movement. Uh, that that might be true or not true, but uh, this is a sort of sense and how, how and also something that is, has been conveyed quite quite often in this discussion. Well, I think that's definitely something we will need to pick up again later on because that, of course, turn, points towards populism and why religious nationalism has the potency that it does have, because it also has this kind of anti-establishment, at least before itself reaches power. And uh, then we'll see how Hayat manages to kind of maintain that, that narrative, even though it actually controls a state. Um, but now let's turn to our other uh, case study, as it were, Alicia. Um, Russia has some similarities with the, the Indian case uh, to some degree, you could say, but also very specific uh, experiences. Russia is a country where the Orthodox Church, like in many countries in Europe and elsewhere, uh, the, the kingship was based on this kind of uh, God-given uh, assurance of, of the legitimacy of power, uh, king by the grace of God, as the phrase goes. And then you had the Soviet Union, 
which by definition was anything but religious, at least in the way it perceived itself and the way it tried to remodel Russia as a country and Russian society. And then we are now back into Russia, uh, a country where the Orthodox Church again is back on track, as it were, and has a very good relationship, it would seem, with the state and, and is not, in that sense, separate from it necessarily. But could you give us a bit more flesh on these bones that I just outlined here? Sure. Thank you so much. I'm also really happy to be a part of this debate. And uh, following on what my colleague has just said, I would say that, well, Russia, I mean, even if you see some similarities to India, it's definitely a part of European historical experience, right? So religion perceived as an organized institution, which is cooperating or com competing for the authority and power with the ruler, right? So this is absolutely a shared experience until 1721, when it becomes subdued, finally, we could say, by the ruler, by the emperor Peter the Great, and then becomes a part of an imperial project. Here could be maybe a link and similarity to how religion was used, how it played in imperial project in India. And so becoming a church of an empire with all what comes with it. So being an instrument of uh, subduing other non-Orthodox ethnicities, assimilating new territories, representing the central authority in the peripheries and so on. So being the pr privileged uh, institution, it suddenly in the Soviet Union uh, became a persecuted minority. So quite a jump in the status. And things were changing, in fact, only in the 80s with Gorbachev. But thinking about what you just said, uh, Rusbek, so uh, did religion really disappear in Soviet Union? I mean, uh, going back to this question, or it was somewhere in the margin? Well, if we just take the social polls, which were conducted somewhere in the 1989, and of course, if we can rely on polls uh, conducted in the Soviet Union, I, I think that they are kind of a good point of orientation. In Soviet Russia, 16% of people said they were Orthodox, 75% people said they were non-believers. And if you take the numbers today, so the question what happened, right? You have exactly a reverse picture. So something around, depending on the polls, but definitely about 60%, 65, 67 of people declare themselves today Orthodox. Uh, non-believers, it's 26%, right? So something did change between 1989 and 2020. And of course the history is quite complex, but um, the, the, the important moment was the, the 90s and the moment of democratization opening up, which paradoxically could seem to us was experienced by the churches which existed nevertheless in the Soviet Union as a threat. The new religious movement that appeared, uh, more dynamic with resources that were perceived as a threat. And so the church went back, I'm talking about the Russian Orthodox Church, which is the dominant one, went back to the ruling authority and asked for help and support. Boris Yeltsin back then, he was uh, he had problems with his own legitimacy, he had problems at home, facing uh, the parliament which was against him. And so this was the moment in 1993 when kind of a uh, cornerstone of the future approach was set. A church which was willing, uh, which, which looked for aid of the state, just like you could say in a way like in the imperial times, and the state which wanted to use religion to boost its own legitimacy. And of course, it's a long way from 1993 and Boris Yeltsin to Vladimir Putin, but one of the main sources uh, or reasons uh, why also religion was uh, perceived by the, by the new elite as something which could be used was the problems of identity or in general identity crisis in the post-Soviet Russia. The question, okay, what now? And now going back to this ontological injustice, maybe it will happen later, but we were, the church was central in that empire. Then we had an extreme secular project, so Soviet modernity, right? Where we wanted to get rid of the religion, even in private lives. And now it's the nineties and what should be done about religion, right? And in the public space. And it seemed like one of the few assets which could be used to build new post-Soviet identity. And the important moment here is that it wasn't that much about religion in a sense that 
kind of personal transcendent attitude to God. Nothing of this was of interest uh, for the ruling elite, but rather religion as something that represents tradition. Historical continuity, giving you a sense of ontological security, if we are to refer to this notion. And as this kind of resource, it was fought to rebuild new identity of post-Soviet Russia. And if we were to place today Russia and what's, what's the main core of this identity, he said, well, we are different, uh, different than the West. We are a distinct civilization. We have our, uh, we stick to our traditional values and what Russia would like to get away with, and this is a com shared postulate by the church and by the ruling elite, is to do away with the ontological injustice because they do see it as a secular hegemony uh, uh, thrown on the world by the West and Russia is one of the leading powers, that is how it presents itself, which would like to bring justice in this way to the international arena. Thank you. Um, now, of course, this also means that trying to create ontological security, you need to, as you pointed out yourself, you need to define something that is not you, right? I mean, you need something that is not part of your group. Now, you can define this in terms of ideology. You can define this in ethnic terms, in religious terms. Um, and one of the things that um, you discuss in your work, and which I find interesting, is the notion of civilization, that somehow these projects uh, are supposed to go beyond the borders of the nation state. And so the concept of civilization as something that is beyond the borders of the actual state uh, helps to still claim uh, both moral, um, traditional, religious, and cultural authority and authenticity uh, that kind of uh, supersedes the secular order through which the borders are actually set. And I find this interesting, not just in the Russian case, uh, but perhaps particularly in the Russian case, because you have so many Russian minorities in the countries that used to belong to the empire or the Soviet Union. Uh, in other cases, like in, in the Indian case, we can talk about diasporas, uh, but they're not part of an imperial legacy uh, in the way they are in, in the Russian case. Would you like to say something about that? Alicia, on, on that aspect? Sure, sure. Thank you for this. Um, with civilization, uh, uh, with the notion of civilization, how it's used uh, in contemporary Russian politics, it's of course, again, <laughs> a complex phenomenon, right? But when we come to domestic affairs, and I would here agree with uh, Russian sociologist Viktor Schneiderman, using the word civilization is in fact to replace the word empire. So to give this kind of formula of identity exactly which would allow to create common denominator for a multi-ethnic and multi-religious population of the Russian Federation. But when it comes to the foreign policy and uh, activity in the international arena, claiming that you are a distinct civilization with your own agenda, this already plays also to the vision of the world and to a geopolitics that Russia favors. So, what we are seeing right now, although now it's of course a bit more shaky, but this is a Pax Americana with uh, West as the he hegemon here in terms of material hegemony, but also normative agenda. And so Russia is one of the leading powers wants to bring the balance and together with other civilizations and here appears China and India very often as these strategic partners they would balance or counterbalance the, the so far uh, dominant position of the West. So for the domestic affairs, this is something which should help to create formula and bring stability and let's say ease tensions between, for example, Muslim communities or Slavic communities in Russia. But in foreign policy, this is something which is also, uh, which has counter hegemonic edge, to put it shortly, counter hegemonic edge and it's anti-Western and tries to undermine the normative dominance of the West. And what comes led, this is the next step, brings or show uh, Russia's own normative agenda, which is conservative uh, turn or this turn to traditional values. Thank you for that cue, because I mean, that's obviously one of the things I think we should investigate a bit more than what, what constitutes this traditional uh, 
religious uh, counter hegemony yeah. and, and civilizational traits. But let's do that by jumping back up on the international scene. Erin, one of the issues that you have studied is, of course, the notion of human rights uh, as a kind of a global agenda, if you will, or a global frame. Um, and here, uh, as we know from a number of treaties that have been signed, there are always exceptions that various states want. And sometimes when it comes to, for instance, to gender equality, they tend to invoke religious particularities to justify why their signature is not fully unqualified, so to speak. It's, it's a qualified signature. Um, could you help us navigate a bit? Where are the battle lines, as it were, uh, when it comes to these discussions on the global arena? I'll, I'll do my best because, <laughs> yeah, it's quite, it, is, it is quite complicated, obviously. Um, but, yeah, I think it also links, this discussion about human rights at the, the global level also links very nicely with what Alicia has just been saying, that there is this, I think, if we, if we talk specifically about um, religion and human rights, there's sort of different levels of, of conflict around it. And there's, there's conflict around the concept of human rights themselves, which relates very much to this idea of um, anti-hegemonic civilization, I think that Alicia was talking about. There, then there's the contestation around the idea of religion itself. And then we also get to specific conflicts between the right to freedom of religion or belief and other human rights. And I, I should say supposed conflicts, because um, one of the things that the human rights um, human rights researchers and human rights lawyers always uh, stress is that human rights are universal, indivisible and interrelated. So the idea that there is a conflict between these rights and that one right has to be, has to trump another right is also something that we need to interrogate. And I think that that does become, that becomes a very fraught issue at the grassroots level. But what we starting to see in the global discourse, I think, is that there is this kind of argument that it has to be, or a discourse, if you like, that it has to be an either or. It's either freedom of religion or belief or it's freedom of expression. It's either freedom of religion or it's gender equality. It's either freedom of religion or belief or it's the rights of LGBTQI people. These, I, I would say that these are kind of the three main areas where we see conflicts that specifically, um, ex, sorry, explicitly label, call out religion. It's, let me unpack all of what I've said there a little bit. Um, so this conflict around the concept of human rights itself so there is very much this idea that human rights is uh, a Western construct. It's an imposition by Western states. It's a it's a modern invention, um, and that was that that came very much to the fore. So in the cultural relativism arguments that we saw in the 1990s, spearheaded by by Singapore, um, the flip side of that is the argument that human rights are they're universal, they're natural, they're timeless. They've existed uh, since ancient Summa, we see these all, we, you know, we can find evidence of, of what we, the, our modern concepts of human rights throughout history. In the, in the end, we can debate these two positions endlessly, and we're never going to reach an agreement because they're mobilized for political purposes and to serve political agendas. So I think there's already been a lot of ink spilled on this debate and I'm not sure how I'm actually not sure how helpful it is to look at which of these positions is correct rather I think it's more interesting to look at who mobilizes which particular version of that narrative and why they choose to to put forward that particular version of that narrative what what political purpose does it serve then if we get to the question of religion, we've already touched on that a bit earlier and then also in the, 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 previous, um, the, the previous webinar as well, but who decides what, what, what counts as religion and what doesn't? Who decides who has access to claim the right to freedom of religion or belief and when that right is being violated and abused or not? And we see very different uh, versions of that and, and decisions on that, sometimes quite contradictory decisions on that, depending on which religion is involved in the specific cases. Um, and this was something I wanted to, to just mention, sort of referring back to what Henrik was saying about the situation in India as well. Not only does secularism create or, or kind of at its heart have this assumption that there is a thing that we can clearly label as religion, but within that category itself, I would suggest it creates hierarchies of different religions. 
And so it privileges some religions because they fit with a secular nation state order and it subordinates or marginalises others. And that manifests differently in the different contexts that we see. Um, but I think that's a really important um, element of secularism that we could explore further. And then the sort of the third spoke of this wheel, if you like, I'm never very good with visual metaphors, but anyway, um, there is, is this specific notion of freedom of religion or belief, the right to freedom of religion or belief itself. Um, and there are some who would argue that this right is, is impossible to, to enforce because there is no clear understanding of what religion is. And there are others who argue that this is like the first freedom and, and we should champion this and it's the most important and this is the right from which all others flow. Um, and I, I'm, not I'm not gonna buy into that debate, I don't think, other than to say, I, I think I'm more sympathetic to the idea that the right to freedom of religion or belief is, is incredibly fraught, precisely because of these debates that we have around what is religion. Um, however, we have this right we have this concept, we use it in our politics, we need to understand how it's being used and why it's being used in particular ways. And that's when we again come to these rights conflicts. So when is the right to freedom of religion mobilised against, and Ruzbe, you mentioned the specific example of, of, of women's rights and gender equality. And one of the things that I think is really important to stress in this conversation is that we often, we often hear the argument that religion is in, inherently patriarchal. And so, and then we ignore the fact that there are also abuses of women's rights and gender equality within secular, within secular institutions, corporations. What I wanna suggest we need to disentangle at least on this particular debate is, is, is the notion of patriarchy. So religion and secularism can both be agents of other power structures. So whether that's, whether that's patriarchy in this case, or whether that is sovereignty, or whether that is another power structure or, or power framework, we have, to, we have to get away from this simplistic narrative that religion is patriarchal, because it's, if we look at on the grassroots, again, there's a lot of different actors who are involved in this. And often there are religious actors who are champions of women's rights, who are champions of LGBTQI rights. There's a lot of them that aren't as well. There's a lot of them that, that are quite anti women's equality and the equality of LGBTQI. But to simply say religion is patriarchal is, is it just, it sim oversimplifies everything too much. And I think it also, means that we ignore other power structures that are in some respects more problematic in these debates. Um, the other ones that I mentioned was, was also the right to freedom of expression. Um, and I think that that is also like, I think all these conflicts between rights that we hear about, and I wanna put supposed conflicts between rights, um, all of these are a function of, of power struggles between different groups within society, those who have the position of power wanting to try and exclude or marginalise or keep down those who don't, and those who are fighting for a greater voice and to have their, their rights acknowledged and their space in society um, given to them. So, yeah, I, I've said I've been talking too much, so I'm going to... I know. I just did, um, for, for a moment, I thought I was kind of uh, coasting to somewhat simpler lands, and then you added patriarchy to it. So now, oh, sorry. now of course, uh, things get even more complicated. No, I mean, I agree. I think, I mean, we could perhaps, to use uh, a concept from a very different uh, context, talk about anthropological axioms mm. when it comes to, you know, when people argue that already in Sumer there were human rights. That's obviously a historical, uh, yeah, but exactly. on the other hand, that doesn't mean that everyone in Sumer thought it was okay to kill your neighbor. Yeah. So th there are some very basic, you know, uh, things that that we can assume. The question is what you infer exactly. from those basic assumptions. And that's exactly. that's when it gets tricky. And that's one of the other things um, that that we've tried to do in in some of our research around this idea of ontological injustice as well, is to say, okay, we have this set of, of universal values there that in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there is contestation about whether it is universal, but what we found in some of the research that we've done in India and Indonesia is that the rights, the, it's, it is sometimes more about the language that is used and how that is communicated and implemented. There's a lot of support for these values, 
at the grassroots. But the question is, it has to be done in a way that is relevant or in, engaging in this work has to be done in a, in a way that is partnering and that is um, sensitive to and, and supports and puts first the, 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 the culture and, and the location, the context that, it, that it's, the work is being done in and the actors who are there who actually know the context and have familiarity with it and are doing the hard work there. And that's something that I think we haven't got yet. That's actually very interesting because uh, I've been thinking in terms of language as a kind of a analogy, um, and perhaps it's a bit like English. I mean, uh, hu human rights is a language with many dialects. The question is, at what point does the syntax become so different between two of them that they constitute different languages? That is, yeah. you know, at what point are they actually very different understandings of what human rights can be? Mm. Um, you pointed to something else, and this is going to be the, the segue to, 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 to India, Henrik, so you're now uh, about to come into the spotlight again. Um, and that is, of course, that we tend to, perhaps, when we're discussing religion, think of it as something very, very mysterious. I mean, you're talking about, you know, this is a question of power struggles, these are different interests, that they, they kind of translate or express themselves in various ways, including justifications through religion. And that's, by the way, how the patriarchy, in a sense, comes into it, because it precedes any religious uh, identity. Um, but in reality, then, it's a question of differentiating between the religious experience and the kind of religion we're talking about, which is kind of almost, you know, it, it's a phenomenon at a very high level. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, uh, what is religion? Uh, are we exactly. talking about the high priests and, and what they claim? Or are we talking about the practice of everyday life uh, and, and how people behave towards each other in that uh, everyday situation? I think that's something that we as, as scholars, as researchers, as political analysts and as commentators need to be much better at. We need to be much more precise, not just use this term religion, but be very precise about who and what are we actually talking about? Are we talking about the institutions, the grassroots actors? Are we talking about the rituals, the belief structures? So rather than just use this shorthand of religion, be far more pointed and nuanced and specific about what we, what we do and don't mean when, we, when we're talking about these issues. Hear, hear. Um, Henrik, uh, this, of course, becomes even more um, complicated and fraught with, with potential for, for uh, fissures within society when we're talking about a country like India, which has, as you mentioned yourself, this this uh, huge uh, variation uh, and also this history which is used and abused uh, depending on how people want to portray their own group vis-a-vis -vis another group. But what is also interesting is that in the Indian case, like in most of these other cases, it's a question of values. And one of the values that often is brought up as being particularly Indian or if you will, particularly Hindu is tolerance. Uh, and what I found interesting when I look, for instance, at the BJP and its history is how tolerance, and we see this in, in, in Europe as well, but often perhaps in more secular ways rather than justified in religious terms, is how tolerance actually becomes quite intolerant because tolerance is how you define your group while the other group is not tolerant and therefore they should not uh, have the same rights or they need to be put under particular uh, enclosures, as it were, uh, legally, because they are not tolerant. But let us now try and see, is there anything you want to comment on that before? Well, uh, one, one thing that I would like to sort of bring back, the, back to the discussion here was um, um, the, the sort of civilizational dimension and also the, the injustice dimension, because I think in the Indian case, these are two quite significant um, dimensions, um, uh, because you know, if we look at how the sort of Hindu nationalism, uh, uh, one of its sort of, uh, building blocks or root elements, is about injustice. Um, that um, you know that that there are certain powers, uh, forces that have held back the Hindu nation uh, uh, through you know um, conquest or through other means. Uh, and and to restore that place, both domestically for the Hindu nation, but also uh, uh, internationally, put India as a Hindu nation back 
uh, uh, where it should belong according to this narrative is, is, is clearly visible in, in the Hindu nationalist um, sort of narrative, both domestically and internationally. And, and I think also this sort of civilizational aspect here is, is important. I mean, for, for Hindu nationalism, India itself is a civilization, but it has expanded, you know, the, it's not really confined to the territorial borders it has today, but there has been influence, Sanskrit influence in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Uh, I mean, parts of Afghanistan today and so forth. So that kind of idea is there as well. Uh, so that was the what I wanted to just comment on. Mm-hmm. But uh, you had a question as well. No, no, I, I, that's that's very good because I mean, in a sense, that uh, conforms to classical nationalism anywhere. Uh, the idea that you have borders and you have a defined territory, but your cultural influence and, in a sense, your uh, jurisdiction goes beyond that uh, territorial boundary, uh, and so that and the most. Uh, nationalisms have to kind of come to grips with how far they are willing to go with those claims, because of course that can initiate uh, or trigger conflicts with other countries, because they tend to think of their borders as the very beginning and end of a jurisdiction. Um, And that of course brings us to the Indian equivalent, if you will, of the discussion we had with Alicia regarding the, the Orthodox Church and its ability to move beyond the Russian borders. But in the Indian case, it's a question of diasporas rather than a kind of a commonwealth uh, idea that we see in the Russian case. And how does that then play into Indian foreign policy? Is that something you could tell us a bit more about? Well, I I think in terms of the Indian sort of um, official view on diasporas has changed quite considerably over uh, uh, since independence. I mean, at the point of independence, Indian diasporas elsewhere in East Africa and uh, and elsewhere were simply not um, uh, factored in. Um, they were not uh, part of the Indian nation building attempt, and they were not uh, thought of as being, you know, part of the mm. almost not even thought about as being in a diaspora. Um, so the Ner- the Neruvian um, uh, India uh, had not that. They didn't really think much of its diaspora. It's only later around the 1990s where, where there was a sort of movement into incorporate um, Indian diasporas into the political project. And it was accentuated, of course, uh, when, when there was a need of uh, money and resources and assets uh, towards uh, the later part of 1990s. So here is a new, uh, you know, a very com- new way of looking at diasporas as parts of the Indian sort of larger nation. Um, and that meant also new forms of citizenships and all that type of, you know, expanded uh, uh, ways of, of incorporating diasporas into, into the Indian sort of larger nation. But, but it's not, um, um, I, I also want to just comment on your question about tolerance or toleration, because there is a sharp line here in, in Hindu nationalist thinking, and that goes, you know, the, uh, minorities or minority groups that are thought of as part of the sort of Indic civilization, I talk about Sikhs, I talk about Jains, Buddhists, they are clearly within that family. But when it comes to some external religions that are, you know, conceived perceived as external, um, Islam or Christianity, they are not perceived to be part of that Indic family. So here is also a sort of division. It's not like it's only one religion and everyone you know, belonging to other religions are excluded. It's, it's more of a, a, an idea of a civilization where there are several religions that um, are included and some that are not. Um, so um, tolerance to a certain extent, I would say. Mm. But so let's now uh, take this kind of domestic makeup that we've been discussing in several of these countries and how and in so far do you perceive that having an effect uh, on the foreign policy of these countries? Henrik, if we'll start with you, would you, I mean, let me start with a very simplistic question. Has the fact that the BJP now has been power for quite some time, uh, uh, has that affected or changed Indian policy in a, in a way that can be traced at least not as the single cause, but at least partly caused by their different view 
uh, on on India and what is Indian identity and and the the centrality of of, of Hinduism, if you will. Well, I think in practice, uh, the BGP's foreign policy is very much a continuation of previous Congress government's foreign policy. But in terms of branding, I think there is a difference. Mm -hmm. In terms of how you label, um, you know, diplomatic initiatives, um, how you, um, uh, you know, the wording that you use, uh, the imagery that you create around diplomatic initiatives, I think that has changed. I think also, um, but I also think that the idea of injustice is also there. Um, you know, one, one part of this sort of ground, uh, the root uh, ideas or, or, or very sort of uh, important ideas of Hindu nationalism, as I mentioned, is that the Hindu nation was somewhat uh, held back uh, because of external forces. Um, and that it needs to restore its position. And the same kind of language and the same kind of narratives you also find uh, for the nation state of India now that, you know, it's time for India to restore its, its uh, right place in, 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 the, in the world uh, and which it feels sort of entitled to, to have. Um, so the nationalism is also sort of translated into exceptionalism in the foreign policy sphere. Um, but I think in terms of real uh, uh, policies, I think it's a lot about uh, continuation, but in terms of labeling, I think it's about, um, um, uh, we have seen some new um, sort of uh, BGP takes on how, how to label your foreign policy. Thank you. Um, uh, Alicia, I'm going to ask more or less the same question to you, but I also have a question from the Q&A and, and please uh, feel free to ask more questions uh, to our panelists. But um, how can we can we see something of that sort uh, in uh, Russian foreign policy? Uh, if nothing else, if, if not necessarily explicitly religious, then civilizational at least. And how would the Russian church play a role in the next elections to the Duma? Is the question. <laughs> Well, um, great, great set of questions. Uh, but I would start with, since you asked about how the domestic plays in foreign policy, I would start with uh, describing you the essence of a partnership between the Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church. Because very often there is this kind of misperception about it as the church which is being used by Vladimir Putin or opposite. So it's the patriarch who is smart enough or cunning enough to use Vladimir Putin. In fact, it's much more complicated because this is a partnership where of course the Kremlin has the upper hand as the state usually does in relation to religious institutions because it is the state which sets the stage, sets the law and so on and so forth. So the rules of the game, but what makes their cooperation, well, I don't know if harmonious, okay, let's say the word harmonious is the fact that they really share a lot of views about the world and how it should be, and what's the role of Russia in it. So this kind of shared worldview uh, of the ruling elite and the church is what facilitates, so at home what facilitates their cooperation in international arena. So what they agree on is the fact that Russia should keep its sphere of own influence in post-Soviet area. And this is a view of the church, which has there its canonical territory, but also of course, Russia and the concept of near abroad. So all former Soviet space with the exception of Baltic states is where Russia should be the dominant player and keep other players out, right? Also the fact that the West is the hegemon and it, uh, and it throws upon Russia and other uh, countries its own order and norms. This is something what the church and the state don't agree. And that something should be done about it. So again, bringing this kind of alliance of civilizations to counterbalance the West. Um, the concept of Russia as a distinct civilization. And this is very something which very much feeds on orthodox identity. Orthodox, Christian Orthodox, that we are different than the West, which Protestant and Catholicism, we have some on our own. And also then later the conservative terms. So they see certain things in a similar way. Why is it so? And the very short answer would be, it has something to do with the imperial habitus of Russian empire, but also the Soviet Union, which had the structure of an empire. And it allows them to cooperate in foreign policy in different ways. So we have cases where 
the church uh, was able to convince the government to play a bigger part in something, and this would be the case of uh, bringing to Russia's foreign policy agenda uh, the slogan of protecting Christians in the world, protecting persecuted Christians also in Western Europe, where they are being persecuted, and Sergei Lavrov, you know, the former member of a communist party who's really concerned about the fate of Christians in the EU, right? This is really something uh, telling, I would say. Uh, so this is something what church brought to the to the government agenda. But we have also another case where the Kremlin used notions uh, brought and promoted by the church, like Ruski Mir, when it comes later to Ukraine and annexation of Crimea, right? Uh, or something where they act in hand in hand, like Arctic region where of course the Kremlin emphasizes this is a strategic sphere. We are active, we are bringing new or rebuilding military bases. And then the church comes, patriarch who comes to the Arctic regions, bring opens new churches, new chapels, and says, yes, this is the strategic place we are here. And we have to make sure that the local indigenous people, Nenets, they will stay orthodox because otherwise they can be hitchhiked by foreign protestants and behind whom there's, of course, American government. So this scope, this something which is based and rooted in maybe imperial past, but works at home, also has consequences pretty visible in foreign policy of Russia. And the last point here, this is possible also because the Russian Orthodox Church is a transnational actor. And this is not an obvious thing, or rather it's a rare case for religious organizations. So this is a, org, a religious organization which, is, which has a structure that goes beyond the borders of the Russian Federation. It covers all post-Soviet territory with the exception of Armenia and Georgia, plus China and Japan. It has its own infrastructure. It has its own diplomatic contacts. It has experience also. So this kind of agent with this kind of capacity is a good partner for the government to have some kind of joint uh, projects or agenda when it comes to foreign policy. That's interesting because, I mean, in a sense, no matter how much we talk about the secular order, uh, whatever that could have been or is, there is a huge continuity in the notion of the territory of the church mm -hmm. and the territory of the state uh, and trying to avoid letting anyone else uh, uh, do some proselytizing, for instance, among a population of a given territory. <clears throat> in order to, to maintain cohesion. Um, may, may I jump in just for a moment? Course. Because what, what you say is this kind of perception, you know, that you have a territory and that uh, religious communities should be categorized and ordered in accordance, let's say, ethnicity is linked with a certain religion. This is something, at least in case of Russia, but I'm sure it goes beyond this. This com comes from the imperial past where there was this kind of way of ruling and managing the multi-ethnic, multi-religious population. And this is still present in today's Russia. This kind of, okay, the, the population is divided into Slavs, uh, which even if they're non-believers, if they declare as non-believers, they are nevertheless perceived as, uh, by the church as the prospectful Orthodox might in the future, right? And if you are non-Slavs, then you could be either Muslims, Buddhists, and so on and so forth. So this kind of perception and approach is there and also is reflected in the politics. And in a sense, historically speaking, we could say that this is a precursor to the notion of the nation state, which expects all of these different identity labels to coincide fully, 100%. But I mean, um, Henrik, you are also an historian. Uh, wouldn't you say, or am I reading too much into it, that there is a kind of an irony and tragedy in that then this idea of these stable religious identities that somehow are easy to pinpoint and delineate is actually part of a colonial heritage that India has, but which has then been incorporated in the nationalist discourse in India and are now part of the notion of the communal India where groups are easily to be separated or subjugated? Um, yeah, uh, well, I would say that uh, it has a very modern uh, uh, tinge to it and that colonialism was part of the modern state project. Uh, so I, I couldn't really separate which one is which here, but I would say that the modern state has an interest in categorizing its, its citizens or subjects, whatever uh, you, you have at that certain point. 
and uh, that uh, you know for, for for bureaucratic and administrative purposes this is important and the imperial project and the colonial project was was very much part of of uh, you know the modern the, the expansion of the modern state project so in that sense uh, it uh, it has uh, for for a country like india and other former colonies i think you know the modern state was brought in uh, by um uh, an imperial power. Um, um, so uh, it's inseparable, the modern and the colonial uh, state form here, I would say. But it means also then that one has, in a sense, rewritten the history in taking some of these traits that came with colonialism and the modern state and claiming them to be a traditional way of understanding identity, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think you can say that, uh, uh, but uh, it's a, it, it's a complex issue, a very complex issue, uh, how identities are formed around classifications and categorizations and then become something that you sort of internalize. And in the end, it's hard to say where, where you know, where, where an imposition started and when the mm. self experience uh, uh, started uh, or is felt. So I, I, I couldn't really differentiate here. Fair enough. Um, we have a question actually from uh, uh, Elizabeth Shackman Hurd, Professor Hurd from the last seminar, and I think it's a good one because it kind of brings us to a, um, a meta level, if you will. Her question is, um, what is the role of public intellectuals who study these things? Uh, uh, what are the best practices you, you've seen in these contexts? And what, are we, what should we avoid in terms of how we go about studying and analyzing these things? And in, why don't you start, Erin? Gee, thanks, Rizbe. <laughs> um, thanks to, to Professor Head for the question. It is, it's a really important question, I think, um, because much of what we do, do as public intellectuals is inform um, both how policymakers approach these, these questions, but also the broader public discourse on it. And, then, and the broader public discourse, of course, um, shapes and influences what politicians privilege and how they approach things. Um, I think it's really important for us to interrogate our own assumptions um, and our own biases on this. Like it's, I, there is this idea that, that academics uh, should be objective on these issues. Um, and I'm of the opinion that it's actually not possible for anyone to be objective on these issues. But what that means is we have to be far more careful and far more um, precise in thinking about what our own biases and assumptions are when we come to these particular issues. Um, and then being able to point those out. I mean, I'm, I'm an international relations scholar by training. So one of the things that I'm always um, always focused on is, is power relationships. And I've mentioned this a few times now. So, um, and I think that's probably one of the, the, the key things that we can do as public intellectuals is point out on, on questions of religion, foreign policy, and particularly on, on questions, of, questions of human rights, because there's an assumption within legal traditions around human rights that human rights apply to everyone equally in all contexts. And of course, in theory, that's, that's of course the case, but that doesn't work in practice. But often that's not observed. And I think particularly when we come to this category of religion, that becomes much more complicated. So that's one of the most important things that I think we can do as public intellectuals. And in terms of the, the pitfalls, I think we should try and avoid taking, taking sides on these issues. Like um, I know there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of public scholars who argue for the significance of the right to freedom of religion or belief and the importance of that. Um, and I think we have to be very careful about that because as we've seen in their discussion today, that right or, or the privileging of that right and the emphasis on that right can also be um, misappropriated and abused in certain contexts in order to push particular agendas. So I think, um, we always have to think about however well-intentioned our own arguments might be, we also have to be conscious of how they could be used in ways that maybe we would not want them to be, and then also, yeah, be aware of our own biases. That would be my very off-the-cuff response to Professor Hurd's question. It's a very coherent one. Uh, Alicia, 
Anything you want to add I to this? I definitely agree with Erin. I would just add the, the usual things which you can add here. I mean, always try to contextualize as much as you can and remember, and remember to be self-reflective. I mean, what you bring to your research with your habitus or however we call it, right? I mean, I, I know exactly the case. I'm a Polish scholar. And usually when I say I'm a Polish scholar who deals with Russia, <laughs> <laughs> this usually is, uh -huh, are you orthodox? And if not, that, what does it mean, right? So what angle do you use? So context and uh, yeah, be always reflective about what, what you're doing and how. Thank you. Henrik? Well, I, I, uh, I agree what has been said already. Um, I mean, I think it's very important to work with the thick descriptions, thick contextualizations. Um, um, and when it comes to academia, then that translates into working um, outside your own uh, discipline uh, with colleagues working in other disciplines. So cross-disciplinary, I think it's important here. Um, I mean, if you're an IR scholar uh, in the, in, in, by training like Arian, for example, um, anthropology becomes very important to get that sort of uh, a story from, from, from elsewhere. Um, and, and so forth. Uh, also for us, uh, Ruspas historians, it's important to, to work uh, with people from uh, um, uh, political science or anthropology again, or whatever it might be that helps us to think outside the boxes that we're trained to think in. Uh, so that I think becomes very important when we dis discuss these things. And always to keep in mind that, you know, the, it, you know things that can be empowering for others can, can, can be the opposite for for other people as well. That's very true. Um, good. I mean, obviously, that in a sense also points to the fact that whatever we do, whatever we study, no matter how we study it, we also study it within a political context. We are not outside of what we study in that sense. Uh, and of course, the, the trick then becomes how to balance that, uh, but also be humble in that we cannot control the narrative ourselves either. So it's we, we cannot guarantee that whatever we say or whatever we find will only be used in a way that, that more or less uh, approximates what we intended. Uh, and that becomes even more difficult in this day where an age where we have social media where things uh, can easily be twisted out of context. But uh, we have a, some other questions as well, uh, trying to, to get to them. Um, there are two in particular I would like to, to uh, get your feedback on. One, of course, is class. Now, the, the question being asked here is specific for India, but I think we can apply it to anywhere. We can also apply it to the global discussion of human rights, for instance, and the fact that people tend to think of human rights as civil and political rights rather than economic and social rights, even though all of them, at least according to the treaties and, and, and the basic idea, uh, are integral. But let's start with India then. To what extent um, can we uh, discern a class aspect to how religion is used, or is there a relationship between them in Indian politics? Well, uh, yes uh, and no. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the segmentation, the social segmentation that has been mostly pronounced, I would say, is of course, in, in, in the Indian cases, the, the, is cost. Uh, and cost itself has also, of course, class, uh, um, um, is connected to class as well, but but you have another type of social segmentation which has been the most pronounced in the Indian case. Um, um, of course, class always plays a role, uh, um, but uh, I would say that the cost uh, differentiation, if I understand the question correctly, has been more pronounced and significant. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah. Uh... I, I wouldn't find a, a way to, to link your uh, class and religion. Creating hierarchies, definitely yes. And it's exactly by bringing certain categories, what's like traditional religions, which are privileged, and then other traditions which are not privileged, but they are tolerated, and other religious communities which are simply either pushed to the margins or even persecuted or uh, criminalized and so on and so forth. But to find a way, a way how the class is related to this, I wouldn't find a way in contemporary Russia. I mean, power relations, yes, here is, yes. But class in this particular case of religion, I wouldn't say that it's that much uh, relevant. They might be wrong. So 
Could one perhaps say that um, in terms of religious nationalism, like any nationalism, the whole point is to at least claim that we are all equal, irrespective of our class uh, belongings, in that we all belong to the nation. So there isn't, in a sense, it's, it's a denial of class, if you will, to some degree, because you're claiming that there is an identity that we all share, irrespective of where we stand in the economic and, and socioeconomic hierarchy of a society. Could be, but when we talk about uh, nationalism in connection to Christian Orthodox in the Russian Orthodox Church, it's a bit different than what Henrik was saying, because he kept saying Hindu nation, Hindu nation, and, and in Russia's case, this is always about the Russian state. So, I mean, when you are talking about the mainstream of what Russian Orthodox Church is saying together with the Kremlin, all this partnership, it's about the Russian state. So it's again, back to this kind of imperial formula, right? Where everybody has place. There is a hierarchy of the nations. Russian ethnic nation is the, the leading nation, but otherwise there is a place in the Russian Federation, which is kind of this, this empire. So this is an imperial, brand of nationalism if you if you want to use this way and then oh, okay and then we are there that class is not important yeah but it's not that much about ethnicity as much as the affiliation with the state which should be the the power a powerful state because the status of the state also matters as a component of the identity mm -hmm. being um a person who lives in Russia, it means being a member of a state which is powerful in the international arena. This is one of the um, criterion of your identity. You know, th this really makes uh, uh, makes a part of being loyal. The st state has to be powerful, then I can identify with it. Well, that in a sense brings us to uh, other classical conceptions such as sovereignty and, and the notion of, of international order as being somewhat Darwinian. But we're going to leave that for another webinar. We have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to throw a an supposedly easy one to you, Erin, uh, interreligious dialogue. Because we're talking about the secular order, we're talking about religion being somewhat more difficult to define than people tend to think. But to what extent can interreligious dialogue on the global arena help politics? Uh, in order to, for instance, diffuse conflicts rather than spur them on. Is that something that you could address? Sure. Um, I would want to unpack a little bit what we mean by interreligious dialogue. Um, also, because again, um, I, I was having this conversation with one of my students today, actually, um, you know, where do we draw the line between different religions? Like uh, Sunni and Shia, is that an intra-religious dialogue or is that an inter-religious dialogue and who gets to decide that? Um, basically, I think my answer would be perhaps quite simple but, and incredibly complicated to actually carry out. But I think everyone who holds different opinions from each other should talk to each other. So I think there should be religious secular dialogue. There should be dialogue within different religious traditions. There should be dialogue across different religious traditions. There should be dialogue across different political affiliations. Um, there should be dialogue across different class, different race. Um, and often I think uh, those categories intersect. Um, so yes, is the short answer to your question, but exactly how that is operationalized is a lot more complicated. Okay, but just as a follow-up, uh, from, from your work, have you seen any of this in practice, any kind of interreligious dialogue that has, in a sense, helped to diffuse conflicts or, or, or increased yeah. interaction in a positive way? Yeah, um, maybe if I can, I, I actually think, I'll, I'll refer to the, again to the research that we did in um, Indonesia and India, because what we found there was that, um, interreligious dialogue was very effective in diffusing local tensions, but it wasn't called interreligious dialogue. It was, it, and, mm -hmm. and religion wasn't the primary point of focus. What the point of focus was, was shared concerns across the different communities. So access to education, infrastructure, healthcare, these, these kinds of shared concerns. And through bringing people together around that and them developing relationships around that, they got to know one another um, and, and learn more about one another's different uh, cultures and traditions. 
and that helped to diffuse tensions within the different communities. So I think um, we have this, this tendency within international politics and foreign policy to either um, make everything about religion or make nothing about religion. And so it, we have to be very, just again, it, 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 we sound like a broken record, but it comes back to context. So, and, and it's, it's the cultural context, the political context, geographic, historical, all that matters in how we carry out these conversations and, and who should be involved in, and the shape that they take. Very good. Um, so in a sense, you could say that it's the, it's equivalent to the secular uh, conversation about maybe solving some of these pro problems isn't about getting the man in the suit with the Mont Blanc pens in a room to sign something, but rather no. to do it from below up. Yeah. Uh, and, and there it's not a question of your title as much as what role you play in the actual uh, local environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left. Alicia, I just wanted to ask you something that connects to this, uh, because in one of your publications, you discuss the fact that the Russian Orthodox Church uh, commends itself on, on having very good relations, for instance, with Iran. So with there, you, you, we can talk about interreligious dialogue, but it seems for very clear political purposes, it's, it's, it's part of a conversation that again goes back to the relations between the states. Is that something you could explore yeah, a bit for us? Sure. I was just listening to Erin. I thought that the Russian case is exactly opposite. You know, I mean, the notion of interfaith dialogue, this is a part of a political agenda, clearly defined by the religious institution, which is the Russian Orthodox Church, and also the official institutions of Muslim communities, so-called spiritual boards or muftiyats. They are the ones, you could say, entitled to be engaged in it, right? And then that's okay. Then this is in accordance with, let's say, a certain state policy. And only these particular religious organizations can do it. So this is always spot of something on the top level, not grassroots level. This is an initiative which can come only from the top and then it's legal and then it's not threatening to destabilize the multi-ethnic and multinational state. And this is something welcomed by the state at home in the Russian Federation, but also again, something which is pursued in foreign policy as kind of element perhaps of Russian soft power. Since Russia is a country which likes to think about itself that it knows how to harmonize relations between dif different religious groups within right Russian Federation, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists and so on. So, there is this official claim, we have the know-how, civilizational know-how, how to bring it and we can share the knowledge with other parts of the world. And also links to Huntington's thesis, right, about the clash of civilization, which is immensely popular in Russia after 90s and so on. This is one of the specter they use to uh, perceive the global order, how the logic of civilizations and that they can crash or clash. And Russia might be the country, right, which has the know-how, how to bring all those civilizations together to one table to be the middleman or all to, to bring them to, to talk to. And the last point here, uh, because of this, the Russian Orthodox Church is especially interested and is being supported by the state in its efforts to create bodies at international organizations, which would allow religious groups to be consulted on international affairs. They would like this kind of consultative bodies to be at UNESCO, at United Nations, maybe in other organizations. And the recent development is that the Russian Orthodox Church has announced that it will be a good idea to create a kind of United Nations for world religions, right? So you see a different way of thinking about religion. Exactly this is what you would like to like us to be really careful about, right? That it's on the top, everything's categorized, institutionalized, and then the representatives of the one and only legit institutions can meet and talk, right? So. Well, that's definitely uh, something that we can have another seminar about. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. It would be very interesting to, to figure out how that's going to work. Um, thank you very much uh, for this very enlightening conversation uh, that we've had. Uh, it's given us ideas for further uh, conversations, like, for instance, discussing populism as part of the political um, uh, radicalization of religion in a number of countries uh, or ideas of identity, including in Europe. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, make that happen during 
the rest of this spring. But again, thank you very much uh, mm -hmm. for your participation. I've learned a lot and I think our audience has as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ruspe. Thank, thank you, Henrik thank and you. Alicia. Thank, thank you. you.